Well, as you can see from the screen, our subject this evening is a quote from Proverbs chapter 3. But it has to be said that it is a subject that is also very relevant to our readings for today. And it is a theme that constantly appears throughout Scripture in varying ways from characters who from their own experience give very sound advice and encouragement to everyone who would be guided by the word of God that we hold so precious. In our first reading today, Exodus chapters 3 and 4, they shows us Moses at the burning bush. At this time he is apprehensive, of course, but nevertheless, this is the sort of starting point, it seems, where he is learning to trust in the Lord God, who calls to him from the bush through the angel, I am the Lord God of your father Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And so he removes his shoes from his feet as instructed, treading on holy ground and communing with the angel of the Almighty. His experiences as he returns to his people in Egypt begin to show a measure of trust in the Lord as he and his brother Aaron demonstrate the signs that have been given to them and the people believe. Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. And that's from our first reading today. And we see there that measure of trust. The people believed. And belief and trust and faith are words that all seem to go very well together. Then we read in that psalm together just now, didn't we? What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. From verse 3. And then uh, verse 4 comes on as well. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. This is a reflection of the level of trust that David had, who wrote this psalm, in the Lord his God. And it should be said that it is the sort of trust that in God that all of his saints should aspire to. I confess that I was tempted to look at a number of verses where the word trust is used throughout the Bible and, and talk about the various uses. But there are so many, there are a number of different words that are translated trust, that I decided to go a different route, which I hope we will all find helpful this evening. Uh, we'll see some of those words on a slide in a moment. But it has been said that the first time a word is used in Scripture is a good starting point. So let me just ask the question, if anybody can answer it, where do you think the word trust is first used in scripture? I've got silence from Mary, I can't believe that. Right. It's the parable of Jotham, the son of Gideon. When the men of Shechem made an alliance with Abimelech their leader, uh, after Abimelech had murdered 70 sons of Gideon and only Jotham had escaped. And Jotham stands on Mount Gerizim and he calls to the men of Shechem in the valley below. Uh, it's the natural topography of the land allows sound, as we know, to carry very well from the mountain top down to the city in the valley below. And Mount Ebal is on the other side, as you can see on this map. I'm not sure whether you used one of those, that very map, Carl, but uh, you'll remember how Carl showed us in a Bible class about a year ago how Shechem lies in this valley between the two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim. And it's from Mount Gerizim that Jotham condemns the men of Shechem for putting their trust in him, in Abimelech that is, and he curses Abimelech for the evil that he's done. He's murdered. He's 70 of his brothers or family. 
But the point of his parable is clear to see from the imagery that Jotham uses. The bramble says, put your trust in my shadow. As you can see, any shadow the bramble could give would be worthless. This was akin to the Shechemites putting their trust in this Abimelech. And by the end of Judges chapter 9, we learn that about a thousand men and women of Shechem, they're all dead. And so is Abimelech, dead also. The value in the incident is, of course, the lesson that God brought about the destruction of Abimelech and the men of Shechem because of the evil that Abimelech had done. And on the men of Shechem who would put their trust in him instead of putting their trust in the Lord God. They should have known what the psalmist was later to declare. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. The word trust here in both cases is the Hebrew word C-H-A-C-A-H, uh, -A -A pronounced Corsor. Strong's Concordance reference number 02620 seen at the top of the next screen is the same word that's used by Jotham in his parable. And it's there uh, up on the top. Translated 32 times that word, which has got that number on the left hand side, uh, to trust and then to make a refuge and to have hope uh, one time each of those. Many different words are used, as you can see on the screen, for the word trust in the Bible, but with slight variations. The Job one is a bit different. Uh, that 0539, the third one down, the word Orman is translated believe 44 times, and only five times as trust, but Job's book was written in Aramaic. And the bottom one, 02342, cool, as it's supposed to be pronounced, I'm told, is also uh, a word that's in Job. Now, I'm not going to get bogged down with a dissertation on the meanings of different Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek words. So, <coughs> returning to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 then, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Now, I think this is self-explanatory in the sense and the context in which it is used. It means to put all of our trust, our total confidence, in the Lord God. Well, what does it mean, and lean not unto thine own understanding? Well, it's a phrase that is clearly connected to the previous one, isn't it? Surely this is teaching the reader that when the Lord speaks, then listen to him. Don't try and interpret the Lord's teaching in a way that we might find convenient. The Lord says in Isaiah chapter 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we need to listen to the Lord. Always. Acknowledging our need to depend on him in all the varying aspects of our lives. So the following verses in Proverbs chapter 3 give very sound curse, uh, counsel. In all thy ways, says the writer, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. That doesn't mean be frightened of him. Respect, give reverence to the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Sound counsel indeed. But some people might ask the question, but why should I trust in the Lord? You know, many of our speaking brethren have given a Sunday evening Bible talk. It titled... Why should I believe in a God I cannot see? Almost an identical idea, I'm sure you'll agree. In fact, I note that in that current plan for March the 31st, Brother Jonathan is giving that very subject at our Sunday evening meeting. 
How do we, though, answer this question in our own minds? I suppose there is no definitive answer to this question because we all have very personal reasons that will satisfy us in our thinking on different levels. But there has to be a great deal of common ground, doesn't there? I can only give you my thoughts in the hope that, to a large extent, we are all in agreement. So, what is it that causes us to trust in the Lord? And by that I mean to have total trust in our God. Well, let's try and analyse why it is that we trust our Lord God. We all recognise the phrase, don't we? In many walks of life we are asked to trust people because of what or who they are. And too many people put their trust in things or in people using that sort of philosophy. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Well, that wouldn't have been much help to the patients of Harold Shipman, would it? Nor would it have been to trust the man who might have said, trust me, I'm the navigator to the passengers on the Titanic. With our Lord God, however, it is totally different. We know and believe that our God is in absolute total control over all the affairs of this world. We frequently use the quotes from Daniel chapter 4, don't we? The most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. Particularly at the present time, during the Brexit issues, when we ask questions as to our preferences, or at government election times as well. You know, many people are flabbergasted that these people have been elected to positions of power in their respective countries. However daft it might seem, however crazy the people who elect them appear to be, though, we all agree they are where they are for a reason. And because the Lord God has caused them to be put where they are. Those reasons might not be very apparent to us, but gradually they can become apparent. And it was very interesting to see a news headline just today, this morning of Donald Trump's secretary, Sarah Sanders. I don't know whether any of you uh, saw it. Eileen pointed it out to me, stating, Trump is the president of the USA because God put him there. One of her correspondents then made the suggestion that it might be the case that God is punishing the American people for their complacency. Well, that's one idea, I suppose. It's very interesting, though, that Trump is in the process of setting up colleges to encourage young Americans to read their Bibles. On another tack, who knows who the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom might be? Him? Could be. People are daft enough to elect people like this. Um, or it might be him. Jacob Rees-Mogg, or, and I'm, I'm glad Joe's not here tonight because I didn't want to see him being carried out on a stretcher, but it could have been him, if you remember what Jim, Joe said last uh, Thursday night on his talk. Or maybe it will be somebody completely different who is yet to appear on the scene. But one thing we can be sure of, whoever it is, it will be God's choice. Not that of mankind. However, I digress. So let's go back to the question in hand. What is it that causes us to trust in the Lord? The answer has to have something to do with personal experience. We all read the scriptures. We learn about prophecy, about prophecy being fulfilled. We compare history with the teaching of our Bible and we understand, as the scriptures tell us, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction 
for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They wrote as they were directed, and they wrote for our learning, for our instruction, that through these things we might find the way to salvation. But is it as mechanical as all that? I don't think it can be. Certainly it has its part, but it cannot by any means be the whole story. There is a quality that we must all have, and it's Jesus himself who identifies it. He who believes and is baptised, Jesus said, will be saved. When he commissioned them to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Belief, almost an alternative for trust. But trust implies something more than belief. You could believe in somebody, but that doesn't automatically mean that you trust him or them uh, or her, whoever it might be. Trust is something that is far, far deeper than mere belief. Now, what do I mean by that? Minnie Louise Haskins was a Bristol lady. She was born in Oldland in 1875, and she lived in Warmley. And famously, she wrote a poem that was read to the nation by King George VI in his Christmas broadcast in 1939. And I read somewhere that it was his then 13-year-old daughter, who is our present queen, that persuaded him to read it. And that poem was also read on other occasions by royalty, including the state funeral of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, in 2002. And the sentiments of that poem are very powerful. There it is, Mary. I hope you can read it from there. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God trod gladly into the night and he led me toward the hills and the breaking of the day in the lone east. That was Minnie Luaskin's uh, poem that the king read. It's a picture, isn't it, of childlike trust. It's a picture of something that is greater than belief. It's having a quality of dedicated trust. As an example of what I mean by that, this doesn't just say belief, does it? It implies trust. The trust that a child has in a caring, loving parent. Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 18? He called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. So back to our picture. I don't think Jesus was saying we have to be childish. childish. Not by any means. Of course he wasn't. But rather that everyone who comes to him and to his father must learn to develop that childlike belief and trust that a young child has in its parents. Ah, but how do we do that? As human beings, we have grown up into adulthood and have learned to become sceptical, to question everything, and to be suspicious. 
sadly, too many people hold attitudes that would drive them away from God. Well, it begins, of course, by listening to God, doesn't it? Through his word. Comparing his truth with the alternatives that this world has to offer. But far more than that, ask yourself the question, how does this child come to have such a trust in its parent? Isn't it because the child's experience is of a father or mother who cares deeply for their child? When the child is otherwise helpless? Unable to fend for itself, the parents are there, showing their care and love in every imaginable way. Yes, I do understand that there are cases when children are abused, but we're not talking about that. We are considering the example of parents with their children in the perfect type that reflects the spiritual pattern. Because our Lord God is the absolute perfect example of a loving, caring father to all of his children. So, what is the definitive example of the perfect parent-child relationship? Surely it has to be that which John the Baptist and Jesus' disciples heard from heaven itself on more than one occasion. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And yes, we have to do exactly that, don't we? We have to listen to Jesus. What was Jesus' prime directive, cold from his Father's word? The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. It's the most important commandment. We then are the children of our Father in heaven, as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 9, which again is our New Testament reading for today, where he says, It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Preferring, of course, not just to the people of natural Israel, but to spiritual Israel, called out of all nations in fulfilment of the promise God made to Abraham that in him and in his seed all the families of the earth could find blessing and be blessed with the great hope of salvation that would come through Christ Jesus our Lord. How, though, can we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength? You see, this kind of love is not something anyone can just turn on because they're commanded to do so. Strong's Concordance shows this word love is from another Hebrew word, uh, or heb, meaning to hold as beloved as a friend and to love in the fullest sense of the word word it is the same meaning as the greek agapeo which is the verb from the root noun agape which i think we all understand it's interesting that scripture uses that hebrew word or heb in differing ways what do you think that might be I'm not ask, asking, you, asking you to answer it because I'm about to show you. Proverbs 18 and verse 24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And then in Isaiah 41, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham my 
friend. And both of those words that are underlined there, they are the same word from the command to Israel, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Who is the friend that sticks closer than a brother? If it is not the Lord Jesus himself. The one who refers to Abraham as my friend, as his father did. <coughs> Coming back to that question then, how can we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength? How does this work for us then? I suggest that it is a question that younger people might find more challenging than the older generation. And now what do I mean by that? Well, it's all a matter of experience. Cast your mind back to those pictures of the child with its father. How does a child learn to love and trust a good parent? Well, it's something that he or she learns by experience, isn't it? Our Father in Heaven does not ask of us a blind faith. He gives us very good reason to believe and trust in him. There are many aspects to that experience that are valuable for us to bear in mind. Trusting in the Lord, our God, with all our heart, comes from what I would call user experience, for want of a better term. Now this is a, com a commercial diagram that I found on the internet that recognises the complete user experience is built up by the fulfilling of a number of basic qualities. And it works very well for us in the spiritual sense. This love for the Lord is not something that just happens suddenly overnight, so to speak. First of all, we have to find him. And so we've got... Uh, you can just about see that bottom left-hand corner. They're findable. Right, must be findable. Well, that's not difficult because our God has made himself eminently findable by giving, his, giving us his word of truth. Job says, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Job, in his distress, is desperate for an answer from God. And of course, we know as we read through the book that eventually he does find his God and he is blessed uh, very, very much. Israel about to enter the land are given counsel to trust in the Lord, to seek him out and to be totally committed to seeking his help. Surely this applies to all of the Lord's people, regardless of the age in which they live. If from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. His message of hope is entirely credible. The red spot, or the orange one over this side. It's, it's credible because the more we search his word, the more we become convinced of the veracity of his teaching. History and prophecy attest to the credibility of the word of God. One of the great tools that we are able to use to demonstrate to people in the world that the Bible as God's word is totally reliable and can be trusted implicitly. And so we can show people from the scriptures and comparing it with history. The Bible's been right all the way down the centuries and still continues to be so. Proverbs declares, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And Jesus said to the Jews, you will remember, in John chapter 5, search the scriptures. For they are they which testify of me, and how very true we find that to be. All through scripture, we find Jesus in so many ways that are just an absolute marvel to those who study the word, looking for Jesus. 
time and time again he is spoken of in prophecy and alluded to in all sorts of ways through the Psalms and through all, all the other books. The blue one at the top left there, he has given us a very usable code of ethics and guidelines in his word to direct our paths into the ways of holiness and righteousness. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's a familiar phrase from Psalm 119. It makes me think that Minnie Louise Haskins probably knew that verse off by heart and based her poem on it. Jesus call to all of his disciples to follow me sets a discipline before us to walk in the path he has set before us. And the Apostle Paul reminds Timothy, and we've already referred to this verse once already, haven't we? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Sound guidelines, aren't they? For all who would live spiritual lives in Christ Jesus. The more we read, the more we learn about what God has planned for those who love him. And with the realisation of the promises that were made to all those who put their trust in him, the more we understand the valuable nature of this book of life. And so we look at this one at the bottom, the yellow one. For what is a man profited, profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Says Jesus. And then in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. These and other Similar quotations are valuable to all who would find the kingdom of God because they teach of the care and the love extended by God to all his saints who place their trust in him. The amazing thing is that although no man can see the Lord God and live, because God says, no man shall see my face and live, Nevertheless, he has made himself accessible to every one of us through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the medium of prayer. And you know, receiving the answer to a prayer is an amazingly uplifting experience. I mean, how many of us have prayed about difficult events in our lives and have been rewarded with an answer. An answer that sometimes wasn't even the answer we were expecting. But in retrospect, we have recognised clearly that we did receive an answer. And it was the right one for us at the time. The more frequently we receive answers to our prayers, the more confident we become the greater the level of trust we inevitably place in the Lord our God. And this is what I meant by the older generation finding it easier to trust in the Lord our God with all our hearts because the experience that he's gained over many years of discipleship has taught us that there really is no alternative. That is a lesson for us then to pass on to our younger brothers and sisters, that Yahweh is our God. As the hymn said, for A it says, for Abraham's God is our God, and Isaac's God is ours. Ours is the God of Jacob with his almighty powers. Knowing this then gives us great confidence and comfort. This is in reality something, of course, that is great.
greatly desirable to all the saints of the Lord. It has always been so for those who trust in the Lord. Job experienced it. David wrote about it. The Apostle John declared it. In all his troubles, Job desired to speak with God. Surely I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God, he says. And then the psalmist in Psalm 145, Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. And three verses later on, further on, He will fulfil the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. These verses, brethren and sisters, they are as valuable to us in our day to day as they ever were when they were penned originally by the psalmist. David was overawed when he considered these things. The Apostle John confidently declared it, didn't he? If we know that he hears us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Of course, James qualifies that by saying that we must ask in faith, nothing wavering. These all are wonderfully comforting ideas that give us the confidence to come near to our God. Yes, he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is more powerful than anything we could ever begin to comprehend. There is nothing that is beyond his capability. He can raise the dead and bestow eternal everlasting life on those who trust him with all their heart. This is the promise that God makes to all of his saints, all of his people. But it is how this promise of everlasting life has been achieved that mostly fills us with awe and wonder. That this almighty, all-powerful creator, our Lord God, Yahweh El, to use his proper name, gave his only begotten son to die in such a dreadful way. Why? so that we can understand the magnitude of sin and that he can and will forgive us our sins when we believe and trust in him with all our heart. No wonder we love him and are caused to place all of our trust in him. All this then builds to the complete what do we call user experience of godly things. To love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. To trust him completely in all that we do. But it means that we have to get to know him, doesn't it? Intimately. And that comes from continual reading and absorbing his word communicating with him in prayer, walking with him day by day, being conscious of the fact that he is always alongside us if we tread his pathway to the kingdom. Many people find the Bible a little confusing when they first start reading it, but little by little, as we know, an appreciation begins to grow, almost imperceptibly at first. But the more we read and learn of the wonderful things that our God has put there for our learning, the more we come to understand just what the message is all about. And guess what? Surprise, surprise, we begin to realise that we love the word and we love the message of hope. And most of all, we love the Lord our God who has given us this, this hope and his son, our Lord Jesus, more and more for what they have done and are doing for us. We have been set on the path to the kingdom of God. History, prophecy, 
And the signs of the times that we live in show us clearly that the return of our Lord is very close, even, as we would say, at the doors. Why wouldn't we trust him with all our hearts? There is absolutely no reason not to. So in conclusion, I leave you with Mary Stevenson's poem, <coughs> Footprints in the Sand, which I will allow you to read, but I won't read it out because I shall start getting all sort of uh, emotional because I do find that quite an emotional poem, but it's there on the screen. Thank you, Carl.